Okay, for this mini lecture, we're going to be talking just a bit more about brain development during the first three years, um, just expanding a little bit on what the textbook says on this topic. Okay, so now we're going to turn to brain development, and we need to talk about brain development on two levels. We need to talk about it um, at the microscopic level, on the, on the level of the neurons, and then we'll also talk about it at the structural level. So in terms of neurons, the brain has about 100 to 200 billion neurons, most of which are born during the embryonic period in prenatal development. And the neurons are basically nerve cells that store and transmit information, and the way that they transmit information is <clears throat> through these tiny gaps called synapses between the neurons. So there's um, not any direct connection between the, the neurons, they communicate via the synapse, and they communicate using neurotransmitters, which are just chemicals that cross that gap, that synaptic gap. So there are several different types of neurons, um, different shapes, different sizes, different functions, but they all have the same basic elements. They have the cell body, which ends in dendrites, they have an axon, and they have these synaptic knobs at the end, and, and it's through the these dendrites and the synaptic knobs that the neurons are communicating with one another through um, the synapse and uh, via neurotransmitters. So what needs to happen in terms of healthy brain development is several connections, synaptic connections, need to be made among the neurons in the brain. So what we have early in development is a process called synaptogenesis, and this is the very rapid formation of, of these synaptic connections. Um, and it's basically very early in development, sort of explosive, to the point that um, the average two-year-old, for instance, has more synaptic connections than the average adult. So think about that for a second. Why would that be? Why would a two-year-old need to have more of these connections in the brain than an adult would? Well, probably what's happening is that the brain is essentially prepared for learning, that it's primed for learning, that everything is new to the very young child, and the brain is going to be prepared to take in just about any type of information and uh, to be able to process that information. However, we're not going to stimulate all of those synaptic connections. So what happens as a result is referred to as synaptic pruning. And this is where the connection is lost, and it's lost because there is no stimulation. Okay, so neurons that are stimulated by input from the environment will continue to establish new synapses. Those that are not stimulated at all or stimulated very seldom start to die off. Okay, and uh, an interesting example of synaptic pruning has to do with our processing of the sounds of language. If you think about all of the different languages in the world, um, well, <laughs> yeah, in the world among humans, right, that they're um, are several different sounds available, but not every language uses every sound available. What's interesting is that the newborn and the infant up until about nine months of age can hear, they can make the distinction between all of these different sounds. They can hear the distinction between sounds that their parents can no longer hear that are not part of their language. So one example is the distinction in uh, Japanese language between R and L. Since that distinction is not used in that language, that distinction gets lost over time. But an infant prior to nine months of age, um, even if their native language is going to be Japanese, they can hear that distinction. But as they are exposed to their native language more and more, and the, that connection, right, that makes that distinction between R and L is seldom stimulated or not stimulated at all, they lose that ability. So after about eight months, they can no longer, eight or nine months, they can no longer make that distinction. Another process that's taking place in brain development is myelination, and we've heard about this before because this process begins during the pe period of the fetus in prenatal development, and this is where the neural fibers um, are coated with myelin, and it's a fatty sheath uh, that coats the axon uh, of the neuron, and it improves the efficiency of message transfer, so it kind of speeds up the processing of information. <coughs> 
Okay, so what we see in terms of um, these processes of brain development is that they don't occur in a very um, smooth, continuous manner. What we see is uh, different periods of um, rapid development in different areas of the brain in terms of both synaptic synaptic formation and also the myelination process. So the curved lines are displaying the formation of these synaptic connections and also synaptic pruning in the auditory and visual areas which are in green, the language areas which is in purple, and the frontal lobes which is in red of the cerebral cortex. And so what you see is that the frontal lobes undergo a more extended period of synaptic growth, that this process takes longer. What's housed in the frontal lobes is all of our higher thinking, all of our higher cognitive processes like problem solving, planning, and decision making. So what you have is in each area there's an, um, an overproduction of synapses and then that's followed by synaptic pruning. The straight lines depict myelination and that occurs at a rapid pace during the first two years and then at a slower pace during childhood and adolescence. And the timing of myelination of, again differs among different brain areas. And again you see that it continues for a longer period of time in the frontal lobes. So th the timing of this um, really matters. Okay, at the structural level of the brain, we're going to talk about the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is the largest structure of the human brain. It accounts for 85% of the brain's weight. It also contains the largest number of neurons and synapses, and it's the last brain structure to stop growing. And what we have are different regions of the cerebral cortex, and these different regions have specific functions. So you have the parietal lobe, for instance, which is responsible for our sensory experiences, so our experience of heat, cold, touch, pain, our sense of body movement. We have the lobe, temporal lobe, which is our primary auditory area. The regions with the most extended period of development, as we've already said, are the frontal lobes. And like I said before, these are responsible for thought, especially consciousness, um, problem solving, planning, regulation of behavior. And so this develops all the way into adolescence and early adulthood. Beyond these specific regions of the cortex, we also have what's called hemispheric lateralization of the cerebral cortex, so that our brain is divided into two hemispheres, and each hemisphere also has associated with it specific functions, so that um, the left hemisphere is responsible for sensory information and control of the right side of the body, of course. Uh, it, you also have language or verbal abilities housed in the left hemisphere. Positive emotion is housed there. In the right hemisphere, you have, the, of course, um, controlling the left side of the body, but you also have spatial abilities housed in the right hemisphere and negative emotion in the right hemisphere. So what it looks like is we process information differently in each hemisphere. In the left hemisphere, where we're processing language, for instance, we seem to be using a sequential step-by-step -step analytic processing, which is really good for dealing with communicative information, right? Think about language and processing this, a sound, which becomes in combination with other sounds, a word, and words in combination with other words become sentences, right? That's a very sort of step-by-step, piece-by-piece sequential processing that's needed. The right hemisphere, on the other hand, is processing information in a more holistic or integrative way. So think about spatial abilities. Spatial ability has to do with you know being able to use a map to navigate your way around town, or being able to um, get your way back to your car in the parking lot at the end of the day, right? So um, that would, would is spatial ability, and you really need more sort of integrative processing to be able to, to process that kind of information. Now what's interesting is this lateralization is not present at birth. It starts early so that, of course, all, already from birth, the right hemisphere is controlling the left side of the body, the left hemisphere is controlling the right side of the body. But uh, for for our other abilities like verbal abilities and spatial abilities, this lateralization process is not complete. It takes time for that to develop. And so what that means is we're going to have more brain plasticity before this lateralization has taken place. So brain plasticity 
is greatest in infancy and early childhood because we do have parts of the brain that are not yet specialized. So if, if there were a brain injury, for instance, since there's not this specialization, the uh, parts, other parts of the brain can take over for the injured part, uh, meaning that the child will then function quite normally. And what's uh, quite remarkable is, is there are examples of children that have been diagnosed with a certain kind of seizure disorder that happens only in one hemisphere of the brain. And so the only treatment for that is to remove that hemisphere. And so there are cases where children have had an entire hemisphere of their brain removed. And if the surgery is done early enough, let's say prior to age three, the child actually recovers quite well. They function normally both cognitively and physically. And that is because that remaining hemisphere, since it was not yet specialized, not yet completely lateralized, was able to take over the functions of the missing hemisphere. So younger children um, are gonna have more plasticity than older individuals. That said, we tend to have plasticity throughout the lifespan. That even um, though this pruning process, for instance, takes place, we can still continue to form new synaptic connections throughout the lifespan. But the ease with which this occurs just becomes less, it becomes reduced because we have less plasticity. Another way to think about plasticity is to think about how much the environment has an influence on the brain. And some animal research has given us some ideas about this. Research with rats, for instance, has shown that if you um, place rats in either an enriched environment, an enriched environment is one where um, it's well lit, they're in cages with other rats, so they have social interaction and they have activities to do like running wheels. If you place them in an environment like that versus an impoverished environment, an impoverished environment would be one where it's dimly lit, the rat is by themselves, they have no activity to do you actually see changes in the brain as a result of these different environments. So that in one study, the rats that were placed in enriched environments had cortexes that weighed 4% more than the cortexes of rats placed in impoverished environments. And so you can actually have a direct impact on something like the size of the brain just based on the kind of environmental input you have. And the environment is gonna have, therefore, more influence on a brain that is more plastic than on a brain that has less plasticity. Therefore, the environment is very important for brain development in early childhood. Okay, related to this idea of brain uh, plasticity is um, the fact that there are sensitive periods in brain development. And so as we've talked about um, that synaptogenesis process takes place early in development and so stimulation is really important when the brain is growing rapidly. If you have extreme early sensory deprivation that can result in permanent brain damage, it can result in loss of functions, and um, that does confirm the existence of a sensitive period in brain development. And there are two different types of growth that we're interested in. One is experience expected, expectant growth and this is um, the type of growth that occurs just in response to ordinary experiences that most of us are expected to come in contact with. Most of us are expected to be exposed to light. Most of us are expected to be exposed to sound. Most of us are expected to be exposed to physical touch, right? And so those are ordinary experiences that still affect uh, brain development. If they, for some reason, didn't occur, then that would have a negative impact on brain development. And so um, the brain is designed to expect these kinds of experiences and use them for growth. And then the second type is experience-dependent growth, and this is additional growth as a result of some kind of specific learning experience. And so this is um, not something that most individuals experience necessarily, but maybe um, is something that's specific to the individual or specific to a group of people. So for instance, uh, the type of education that you're exposed to, for instance, definitely has an impact on brain growth, but that can differ from person to person. And uh, some ex examples of this from animal research. Uh, animals, if you temporarily blindfold them for the first several weeks of life, they never develop normal vision. And this is even um, though the, the anatomy of their eyes is perfectly normal, they need to have that expectant experience of light exposure in order to develop vision normally. Uh, also, uh, in regard to humans, uh, 
needing to diagnose a newborn as blind or deaf is really important that that happens early because oftentimes you can treat these conditions with surgery or you can introduce some kind of visual or auditory aid early in the first weeks of life and that will help to prevent that um, synaptic pruning, that atrophy of neurons that are primed to expect that visual or that auditory input. Further evidence of these uh, sensitive periods comes from research involving children that are raised for part of their lives in orphanages. Um, these are, this is a, a chart is an example of children that are raised in Romanian orphanages uh, versus those that were in a, a British orphanage and it's comparing um, children that were adopted at different ages and so you have children that were adopted at less than six months of age and then those that were adopted somewhere between six to 24 months and those that were adopted um, between 24 to 42 months so much later and you can see that if you're adopted at less than six months the um, quality of your orphanage doesn't seem to matter very much in terms of its effect on cognitive impairment. There's a long history of Romanian orphanages being very, very depriving and very poor quality, so this is why we make this particular comparison. And you can see that um, the longer that the child stays in the orphanage, the more negative the impact is on their cognitive impairment. So children who um, are staying for a longer period of time, don't experience as much cognitive catch-up as children that are leaving at earlier ages. They tend to have the most severe and persistent effects. Um, even though they have adequate nutrition, it's all of the other um, aspects of the poor care that seems to have an impact on their cognitive development. Now, you should keep in mind that this is a correlation, right? So it's not an experiment. Um, we can't say definitively that being in the orphanage causes this cognitive impairment, although we, you know, feel pretty confident that's what's going on. But, you know, since it's a correlation, uh, it could be the other way around. It could be that um, cognitive impairment, right, the more cognitively impaired the child is, the less likely they are to get adopted at an early age. <laughs> 